Welcome to the 18th edition of Vienna Shorts and of course to the second day of our industry programs. Um, a quick summary for those who missed our first sessions. Yesterday we started with the talks about our this year's kind of main topic, digital access to art and culture, where we had a closer look on how other art institutions and events are working. We got a wonderful insight into interdisciplinary and collaborative work with our first talk, learning from each other now more than ever. And we learned more about the development of um, online short film presentation and how cultural institutions are currently dealing with their online presence um, during our second talk, online culture achievements and aspirations. The topic of mixing media or uh, collaborative work and uh, mixing disciplines will be uh, further discussed today, but we will shift our point of view and hear more about how artists, filmmakers and curators are fusing the worlds, which is kind of the second topic uh, related to our main focus, digital access uh, to art and culture. My name is Maria Milovanovic and I will be your host for this talk and I am very, very happy uh, that we start our session with a presentation of Kevin Billy, who is going to talk about his work and also the different contexts in which um, he has been presenting his work. Welcome, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. It's really great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yes, before we now um, dive into the work of Kevin and uh, hear more about it, um, a short introduction. Uh, I think you will tell the most about yourself. Um, um, yeah, yourself. So you are a filmmaker, a film critic, uh, a pioneer in the field of desktop documentaries and video essays. And um, I think you will tell us a lot about that. Um, for everybody who's now joining us, um, if you want to ask questions or share your thoughts with us, it is possible to do that in the YouTube chat, uh, which you can see next to the, to the stream. Um, for all those who are joining us in the um, Festival Hub or through our website, please keep in mind that if you want to ask a question, then switch quickly to YouTube. Um, yeah, so this uh, this much about the organizational stuff. And now, Kevin, the stage is yours. Thanks again, Maria. And welcome, everyone. Um, good to virtually see you. I don't see you, uh, but um, I think I feel your presence through the Internet. And I hope that... Um, we have a great exchange. Uh, whatever I say, I hope it's interesting enough to inspire you to offer some comments or feedback in the chat, either through the YouTube channel if you're watching there or, um, or the other platforms available. Um, so I've been invited to give this talk, I think because as Maria said, I've worked very um, prolifically in the realm of desktop cinema, which uh, I can personally attest has taken on a new relevance in the last year of Corona with the whole world being stuck in indoors and kind of dependent on the internet to um, maintain something like what normal life used to be. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's really um, led me to uh, have a lot of experiences and new thoughts uh, relating to my work and relationship to desktop uh, filmmaking. So I, maybe some of you who know my work would expect that I would use my desktop as my presentation and you are absolutely correct. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I want to see if there's a way that I can view the chat while I'm doing it. I think there's gonna be a, like a little black box uh, maybe in the corner. And that's my chat window in case uh, I get any feedback. Um, apologies if there's any problem with the internet, if the internet connection is not um, so strong at any point. That's just how we live lives these days through this kind of fragile connection. Um, but uh, I hope that what I say is, um, is, is clear enough. And yeah, as I was saying, uh, I've been very active giving talks and master classes on desktop cinema since the beginning of the pandemic um, and these different institutions. Um, I, I, since I've given that talk before and it's actually available on the internet, I can um, just point you to this, this link. Um, you can even Google like desktop 
desktop documentaries tutorial with Kevin Lee. If you're so, if you're here more to like get some insight into how desktop filmmaking works, uh, these resources are already available. Uh, I'll even put this in the chat, uh, and it can be shared that way. So, um, yeah, and this this would give you an idea of what I've been talking about um, in many classes and events for the past year. But because I, you know, I've done that so many times, and I, I feel like it's a great um, opportunity and invitation by Maria and the and the festival to think uh, some fresh thoughts about what my experience has been. Um, I can maybe be a little more uh, frank about uh, some of my experiences and the change of my perspective in the last year. Uh, by the way, this is a, a warm greeting from Berlin, where I am right now. I feel like it's always important to um, acknowledge where we are in the world, even as we connect with each other online, that we are physical bodies, organic beings in this organic um, planet that that is uh, maybe more fragile than we uh, um, assume. And so it's a warm greeting from Berlin. Um, but I can also take you to one year ago, when the, the literally two days before the United States shut down in the, um, the first wave of the Coronavirus pandemic, I was in the last film festival that I have attended in presence, which is the True False Film Festival in Columbia, Missouri, a really outstanding documentary and nonfiction festival. And I was there to attend a program called PRISM, which was um, a program for filmmakers of color uh, from different diverse backgrounds to talk about their work. Um, and it was a very intense, uh, uh, experience uh, just to be in this small room with everyone kind of close together and sharing very um, personal, intimate experiences about their um, their personal relationships to their communities, African American, um, Latino, um, Indigenous uh, American, Asian American, um, really talking about the care that they have for um, communities and people who they wanted to lift up. Uh, experiences that were being ignored or uh, devalued um, or mistreated that they wanted to uh, make visible and make respectable. Um, to be honest, I was very, actually quite uncomfortable. I don't know if you, you might even see this in my body language. I've got my arms crossed. Uh, I honestly was a bit nervous to be here because everyone here was talking about their own community and their own, um, their own sort of social cause. And I had been invited to talk about my work, um, but my work at the time was not so uplifting. It was a, um, it's, it's an investigative documentary about the, the media produced by the Islamic State and their lasting legacy on the internet. Um, I guess for me, it was more of an interest in um, exploring the dynamics of online media how it moves through the internet and lands on our desktops and how we experience it as a desktop cinema experience. Uh, so the program, the, the, the project is called Bottled Songs. Uh, we showed two chapters it's at the True False Film Festival. The complete uh, four chapters will be showing at the Rotterdam Film Festival starting next week in case you're, uh, you're interested. Uh, it's a collaboration with Chloe Galabellene and myself. Chloe Galabellene is also an outstanding documentary uh, filmmaker using the desktop. And we, to be honest, we were um, rather traumatized, as you might imagine, from using this, uh, this material to kind of investigate how it works online. And um, yeah, it was interesting that we were getting so many invitations to talk about desktop cinema when we ourselves had had like the most difficult and traumatizing experience with desktop cinema. Um, so thinking about how we could actually um, recover from this experience, we were both looking for ways to get away from the desktop. Um, and so just in the last week before Corona, when it was still possible, we had this um, screen installation um, in the, the art museum, the Columbia Art League in, um, at, at the True False Film Festival. Um, and we wanted it not just to be a physical 
installation, but also a way to create connections in an analog way. So we had this letter writing station uh, because the project is four letters that each of us write to each other online. So they are video letters uh, recorded on our desktops. But again, we just wanted to get away from this desktop experience. So a physical um, location and um, these analog handwritten letters that we asked our audience to write to us and put in this mailbox. Um, so just in the last week, I, I really um, am grateful that just before coronavirus, I had this chance to really explore an analog way of interacting with an audience and uh, rethinking my, my work. Um, so in this, yeah, in this um, presentation, we had workshops talking about um, our work. And again, I was a bit um, nervous that I was talking about works, um, not just kind of in a, in a very um, complicated and critical way, uh, not this celebratory um, uplifting of a community, but one that also um, has these kind of stigmatized and charged associations with, um, with Islam, with uh, Arab uh, peoples and cultures uh, that actually, to be honest, I had not fully appreciated. I had only thought that I was doing this useful media analysis work looking at um, terrorist media, uh, but through these conversations at PRISM, um, I got to understand that um, I could not just see it in terms of um, of digital um, media analysis, but I really had to see that how it reflects uh, different cultural um, and political dynamics that I, yeah, I, I really need to, to engage with. Um, I will say that I was surprised that uh, the people in the audience um, responded as positively as they did. Uh, and, and there's a quote here, which I actually did not know about until I was doing research for the presentation today, um, that uh, people said that they appreciated how this um, investigation sparked discussions of weaponizing empathy uh, by looking at how ISIS propaganda uses the aesthetics of empathy to create this kind of emotional um, attraction or, or bond and thinking about how that compares with someone doing um, a video on behalf of social justice or equality. Um, you know, what are the differences that, that define this in terms of how the, the form and the, the technique, the aesthetics of empathy can be used? Um, so I was very grateful that this audience was as receptive and as generous um, and I think, to be honest, if it had not been in this space where our bodies um, could be shared and, our, and we could really see each other and, and feel our presence, that this empathy could actually allow for um, such a, a complex uh, discussion. Um, and so I ask myself these days, uh, how can these difficult conversations, these sensitive uh, topics be facilitated in this realm that we find ourselves in right now. Um, so for me, uh, the question of uh, cinematic space uh, is not just one where we're watching films, but it's also a sharing of experiences. It's a social aesthetic that we have to think of how we design. Um, and yeah, it, it's really uh, become more of a, of a question for me, uh, especially once I found myself in lockdown, um, it was just in the, the days after the PRISM workshop that I went to visit my family in San Francisco. This is a, a view of my hometown. Um, and then I spent the next uh, three months here uh, in lockdown with my family in San Francisco. Um, and in this time, I had a lot of time to think about my relationship to space, uh, my relationship to my, my family, my childhood, my memories, and to cinema. And so um, and also looking for as many opportunities to get away from the desktop as I could, because I was spending so much time uh, uh, giving talks and uh, giving my lessons. I teach at an art school in Stuttgart, Germany, uh, just finding ways to get away from the desktop. Uh, so by doing this, I um, 
started to think about my memories of, of uh, childhood and cinema and also the relationship, the, the memories I had just, uh, the, the experience I just had with the workshop thinking about uh, the relationship of race and racial politics, um, how they inform my own um, relationship to cinema. And all of this kind of came together with this video that I would like to show uh, now, which is called Once Upon a Screen Explosive Paradox, uh, which was filmed in my hometown um, as a way to get away from the desktop and to think about cinema in space, in a physical space, um, relating to my childhood experience and relating to a lot of thoughts I had about, uh, yeah, racism um, that were starting to become more present in my mind. So with that, um, I think we we will be able to watch this on Zoom with um, yeah with the help of our of our support. So uh, it's about nine and a half minutes long. So let's go ahead and watch it, and um, I'll continue afterwards. This is the former location of the AMC Ceremony 6 movie theater, the movie theater that my family and I would go to back in the 1980s. It shut down sometime in the 1990s, and then the building became this liquor store. But if you look carefully, you can still see the lighting fixtures from the original movie theater. It was here that my family and I saw the movie Platoon in 1987. I had read about the film in the local newspaper, the San Francisco Examiner, which described the film as an explosive paradox of a movie. And I remember opening the dictionary to look up the word paradox and still not understanding what it meant. It made me want to see the film even more, as well as a rave review by Siskel and Ebert on their television show where they hailed it as one of the greatest war films ever made and a true achievement in cinematic art. But I think it was when the film won the Academy Award for Best Picture that my father was convinced that he should take me and the family to watch Platoon. Then we went to the movie theater and my father told my mother to take me over to the box office, which I believe was around here, and buy two tickets, one for my mother and one for me. And as my mom and I walked over there, I looked back and I saw that my father and my brother were standing by the front entrance. And my father leaned over to my brother and said, go, go run inside. And my brother, who was six years old at the time, I guess he thought it was a game, ran inside the movie theater. And then my father went to the ticket taker and said, oh, my son just ran into the movie theater. I need to go get him, I'll be right back. And so he ran in after my brother. And then my mother and I walked over with our movie tickets and the ticket taker led us through. And we went into the movie theater where we found my father and my brother at the entrance for Platoon. So now we're on the other side of the movie theater and I think this is the screening room where my family and I saw Platoon deep inside the building. So the movie started and I remember just a lot of killing and a lot of dying. It wasn't like anything I'd seen before because up to that point, I'd seen movies like Star Wars or cartoons like G.I. Joe, where when someone dies, it registers more like a dramatic effect. And you don't really feel like 
a life has been lost. But I also remember a lot of sadness and tiredness and anger in these American soldiers. I saw these men inside something that was much bigger than them. And I saw what it brought out of them. And somehow, I was there with them. But then there was this one scene where one American soldier takes the butt of his rifle and smashes the head of a Vietnamese villager. And he stands over his body and he says, you ever seen brains like that? And this took me out of the movie, not just because it was so violent, but it took me to the playground of my school where a couple of boys had been going around saying, you ever seen gook brains like that? And calling the other kids, gook brains, gook brains. And the crazy thing is, these two boys were Filipino Americans. Most of the kids at my school were Asian. And me and the other kids didn't really know what they were talking about, but it felt threatening. And then, when I saw this scene, I realized that they had seen the film. So, I actually don't think it's necessary to show much footage from the film for the purposes of this video. Although there is one scene that I would like to show. So after I watched the movie, the next day at school, I went up to those two kids who were calling everyone gook brains. And I told them I'd seen the film. We talked about this scene, and one of them said, yeah, suicide. Never seen anyone kill themselves like that. But I knew he'd gotten it wrong because after the movie was over, my family had gotten into the car, and as we drove off, my father asked me what I thought of the movie. I was shaking so much, I didn't know what to say. So then he asked again, what do you think this movie is about? And I just started crying. And I couldn't say anything except for one word, which was war. And then he said, this movie has a lot to teach you about how to survive in this world because this world is against you. This world wants to destroy you. So you have to be smarter than the world. You always have to find a way to beat the system. Just like that black guy. So at the end of the movie, there's the big fight and he survives because he takes out his knife and he stabs himself because he knows that if he's hurt, he can go home. You see, that's smarter than what the world can figure out. So you have to find a way to be smarter than the world or you're not going to survive. My father survived the Cultural Revolution in China. He escaped persecution, but I guess he still carries a lot of pain and anger and violence, which he found in the movie and then projected onto me. Just like all the artistic accolades projected from the critics and the awards onto me and the jokes, the racism, the blood and the death projected from my classmates onto the version of the movie that played in our playground. And I guess I still wonder to what extent these three movies coexist. 
and how they're at war inside of my memories. But the movies live on. Okay. All right. So that is Once Upon a Screen Explosive Paradox. Um, I'll go back to sharing my screen. So this video actually um, exists online. It's on Vimeo. Uh, to give you some background, it was produced as part of a commission by an online film studies journal, an academic journal called The Cinephiles, uh, that was looking for video essays that could uh, explore the experience of childhood trauma through movies. So this was answering this commission. Um, there's some really great uh, works in this collection. Um, and after it had been published uh, on this online journal, it eventually found its way on this poll of the best video essays of 2020 uh, by Sight and Sound magazine. So it, it does exist online, it has circulated online and it's been recognized online. Um, but additionally, it's also being programmed in film festivals. Um, uh, earlier this month, it was at the Oberhausen Film Festival, and next week it will be at the uh, Kurtz Film Festival, the Short Film Festival of Hamburg. Um, so maybe you, you ask yourself, like, how is it possible that a video that exists um, online and can be watched online um, can also circulate in a film festival? Uh, you know, I'm not a film festival programmer, so I cannot give their perspective on it. But I do think that uh, if the last year has taught me anything, it is that the internet is a very, very big space. And just because something exists online and circulates online doesn't mean that um, it's seen by everyone who would um, appreciate watching it. And there's always a chance of creating new spaces and new contexts, new audiences, um, and new communities around a given work or a given program. So it's not necessarily that a film is like exclusive to this or that. At least it challenges, it, it allows us to challenge this logic of exclusivity of, you know, that has really dominated the, um, the, the uh, film festival space as well as the art gallery space. I think the last year has really done a lot to disrupt these notions of like, um, these gates and these walls that create uh, exclusivity and value by limited access, um, that this, this opening has allowed us to think about how we can reorganize uh, channels of access and circulation and connection between um, communities and audiences configured all over the world. Uh, that it's not so much uh, uh, limited to like geographic specificity, uh, at the same time, we do lose a lot by not being in a physical space together. So I'm not I'm not saying that this is like a preferred um, option to what we had before coronavirus, but I am acknowledging that it does allow for new possibilities. What does that possibility? Um, what do we do with that possibility? Is really the question, and I think this is something that we're still in the the process of figuring out. Um, you know, I, well, I told you I, I went to the Oberhausen Film Festival. Here's a, a screenshot of their meeting space. Um, and it, 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 I found it very interesting. Um, I, I actually forget the name of the platform that was used, but it was, you know, this is the, kind of like the lounge area where um, everyone, you know, becomes an avatar, kind of like a bubble avatar. Uh, it's it's just interesting to me as a as a former film critic to analyze this as a kind of movie or to analyze it in terms of form that we are all these kind of bubbles <laughs> uh, floating through this kind of dematerialized or like abstracted physical space that has these like levels and screens but still for the most part rather abstract um, and that we would kind of float in and out amongst each other to like 
um, engage in conversations. Um, I, I did wonder as I was participating in this, like, why, why, or could they have uh, somehow replicated the um, the actual physical spaces of Oberhausen? Um, because I have very fond memories of going to Oberhausen and kind of standing outside the main cinema, and everybody would just come out after each screening, stand and you know smoke or drink or just talk for like an hour uh, just outside uh, about the films that they watched. Um, that kind of just uh, ability to congregate in a space that had its own distinct qualities. I still remember the image of just being there. Um, yeah, and that's really what defines Oberhausen for me. So I was a little um, curious why that, that specificity of space uh, was not replicated in this platform or if it could be. And I guess that's also why I, I think of like, you know, offering you these specific spaces and places uh, uh, in my own presentation. Um, so speaking just a little bit more about the specificity of space, now I come back to Berlin, um, but uh, I teach in Stuttgart, as I said before, uh, but I have not been allowed to go to Stuttgart to teach in presence for the last six months. And I find myself asking like, how can I replicate the space of, um, of Stuttgart? So I use a platform called Oh Yay, which is um, another, another platform that allows for you to kind of replicate a physical space and allow others to see each other inside of it. Um, yeah, and this has been very interesting. I've allowed my students to uh, experiment with this almost as a way of um, set design. It's almost like a way of learning set design and of production design. Uh, it does have this strange kind of cinematic um, resonance to it because it's like, what kind of space do you want to produce for others to, to find each other? Um, so uh, this is kind of one example of what we do. Um, but it has really led me to think a lot about how film festivals uh, gallery exhibitions, they are their own form of film and media production. Um, I don't know how obvious that was in the past before Corona, that uh, we would be so focused on the movies and the short films and the, you know, the things that we were watching on the screen that we weren't paying so much attention to how the, the whole apparatus, the, the spaces that we were in were productions in themselves and that they did so much to inform and to give meaning and significance to the experience of viewing. Um, and so I've become much more sensitive and appreciative of the surroundings and to the extent that that is what defines uh, the experience of cinema. Um, so in that regard, I could maybe end with uh, a little bit of a formulation. Um, and you have to you have to forgive my very very bad German, um, so I'll, I'll try I'll try this in German and maybe Maria can correct me. Uh, es geht nicht um das was und das wie, sondern um das wer und das wo. All right, in English I'll say it. It's for me. It's not about what and uh, what and how, but who and where. So, in the, you know, if we think about 20th century modernist theory, we would talk about form and we talk about content, right? Uh, what is the movie about and how is, it, um, how is it executed or realized through cinematic form? But if the last year has taught me anything, I care much more about the who and the where, uh, the context, and the connections of, of people that define for me the cinematic and the artistic experience. And so my own focus has really shifted in this direction. And for me, this is uh, kind of like the, the essential questions uh, that inform my own pursuit of, of cinema. So I think that might be enough to, uh, to end with, uh, but I welcome your questions and I, I thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, this was amazing. Uh, insight. Uh, I think there's definitely a lot to, uh, more to hear about uh, your work. I think maybe we can start 
I've made a lot of notes, but uh, now it's all over the place and everything which you said also kind of uh, answered some of the questions that I wrote now, but I will try to recap what kind of uh, stuck now with me. Um, I think that the, what I really now got out from your talk is this transition, what was kind of um, a topic for you. Um, on the one hand, I, I do see a transition from your from your former work, which was really uh, online. So it was presented online, experienced online, meant to be online. But now there's this transition uh, into a cinematic um, area or field. And I was wondering how, how does this actually feel for you in the way of, do you think that in this transition, something is getting lost of what you want to say uh, through your work? Um, actually, it's, it's, I find that it's offered me more things to think about than I can even process. <laughs> so, you know, it really is a, kind of an explosion of um, new experiences and new possibilities. Um, or at least uh, if one has to kind of... Um, adapt themselves to, to perceiving and to appreciating all of these new possibilities that exist within an online space. And I think uh, that involves us kind of thinking less about how these things are supposed to function just to kind of allow us to maintain some sense of like normal um, way of the life that we had before. Uh, that okay instead of meeting in person we meet online and this is just like what we what we use as a way of kind of maintaining that um, that old way of doing things but instead of instead of kind of using it as a as a kind of a, how do you say as the thing that mediates um, I like to think of it as the as the object itself the thing the thing in the foreground instead of the thing in the background you know what I mean like we're just gonna, you know, instead of like, oh, let's just use Zoom just to like get through this and just do it because we have no other choice. For me, it's like, okay, this is Zoom. Let's see what we can do on Zoom. Let's let's see if we can, you know, do things with filters. I don't know if, if I would, I don't want to play with the filters right now, but um, <laughs> you, you can do a lot of, you can do a lot of things with filters and backgrounds. Like this is what I'm teaching my students now. We have a class called Screen Stories Live and Alive where, um, you know, uh, it's it's about experimenting with these states of liveness and using the platforms and just playing with it the same way that you would play with all the features of a camera or the features of your editing software to create different effects and to yeah to to find new new inventions. Um, so why can't we use Zoom as a creative tool the same way that we use uh, these other um, technologies? Yeah, actually, I have I've written down here now in my notes, uh, technology, how important is it for you? And uh, I think, yeah, you already kind of dived into that, that uh, you are quite creative in using uh, new technologies and put them into a cinematic context. And also the question what I had before was um, because it was out of uh, a personal experience that I had this year. Um, I'm working for a while now as a curator, but I always did this for a cinema context. And then this year I was facing the situation that I uh, should curate a film program. And I'm not talking about a festival moved online, which was supposed to be in real life. I really talk about it should be an online film program. And I started looking into research and I kind of met this uh, two words which were the biggest obstacles in my curator career which were online aesthetics and this was the thing where I was like what the heck is actually online aesthetics and how do you define that I mean in the end I wish I would have talked to you before I started curating <laughs> this program but um, this was just so much uh, in my head that I really tried to force um, I don't know, this genre is in a concrete um, category or area or context or place. And uh, yeah, talking to you, uh, place kind of seems uh, irrelevant, uh, which, I really, which I really find um, impressive in a well, way. Well, it, it is and it isn't like, I mean, yeah, in a way we are kind of in this digital placelessness because the internet is vast. Um, almost infinite and uh, you know many things we experience are so decontextualized uh, 
just how we encounter things. Uh, it's not specific to place. Um, but at the same time, and I hope that my talk really conveyed this, that there is a hunger and a yearning for place that you, you know where you are. Um, and it is this kind of um, duality between the sort of freedom and the exploration and the, the constant recontextualization that one can experience through uh, online internet experience uh, versus this longing for home um, and kind of the, the, the sort of uh, ongoing question of like, okay, where am I in this? Uh, what does it mean for me to be talking in Berlin through this connection with you, Maria, you know, in, in Vienna? Um, and where, where do we find each other? And where, what exactly are the conditions that create the sense of, okay, we are together. Uh, we feel this sense of, and, and it's, it's interesting that, um, yeah, in this case, it's not so much even about like place, but about uh, temporality that, uh, what we, for me, what defines a digital place has a lot to do with my experience of time. That in this moment, my attention, my focus is here. And I really feel the sense of being uh, and talking with you. And so I think for curators and filmmakers, um, it's really important to use time, to use digital time um, and to kind of create the state of of attention that allows us to take in, to remember, to feel, and to internalize this moment. Um, I, I really felt this in the last year because there were so many festivals and so many programs and so many playlists and things like, you know, and it's like things that, you know, if you're watching it in a cinema, uh, okay, you're sitting in the cinema and you have, you have no choice but to really be there and appreciate it. And so it really shows you how much of cinematic experience is dependent on the cinematic space yeah. so then how do we create that circumstance within this um very fragile very dynamic very hyperactive um environment of the internet i do think it's possible um and you know given what i had said before about uh these kinds of like gardens and walls and and scarcity uh economy of like uh, film festivals um that actually it, it may have a role to play in this, that you have to feel like you are, you are doing something that feels special, that it's not something you could just like click on and like, you know, check your emails while it's playing in the background. Um, it's like, you know, it's happening and it really needs you. It, it needs you to be there. Um, and, and this is why I said like, you know, curators and programmers, they are kind of like the new filmmakers now. <laughs> because you you have to be creative. You have to you have to now generate these states of attention that in the past were uh, you know mostly the filmmakers uh, and artists' uh, responsibility. So it's it's really a a team effort. Definitely, yeah. I mean, this is also what I learned during the last year. And um, also one thing, what when it comes to the presentation of, of film work or videos online compared to um, cinema is what, what you also mentioned a bit is this uh, physical experience, right? Because I mean, there, there have been a lot of meeting platforms where like you could gather and chat and then it's again, just the digital thing in the chat, but it is still not that you see a facial impression expression or that you see interaction because this is just so much part of a festival or an exhibition or wherever a piece of, work is exhibited. And you mentioned before the interaction with audience. And this is also something um, what, what I was wondering because like how, how was the interaction with your online audience now compared to uh, a real life audience? I mean, this is something completely different. Is, is it something that you needed to get used to or was it like a natural thing that just happened for you? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess what you call a digital native. So I've always kind of uh, been very active with online and just, you know, text messaging. It's, it's really not that different. Um, and I actually find it very ex exciting to um, operate an online chat while I'm presenting. I often like to do it while I'm presenting, just as a, a form of, um, I, I experience this almost like a form of live cinema where, um, you know, someone makes a comment 
and in the chat and somehow it determines the direction of the presentation. So it's very interactive. Of course, this, this requires more kind of attention and, and activity and energy on my part, but uh, I, I find it also a bit like a game, like kind of like playing a video game where you, and, and this is what uh, gamers do, uh, where they're playing the game, but also uh, doing a, a live stream chat at the same time. It's like this sort of hyper-attentional multitasking. Uh, it, it is something that I think younger generations are more comfortable with. Uh, just like, you know, give me as much stimulation as possible. I, I can take it all. Um, yeah, and I, I can also see why this is also uh, something worth criticizing as well, because it is it is one mode of attention. It's the hyper mode of attention. And uh, in some ways it goes against cinema because, you know, cinema in some ways asks you to not be so active. Uh, actually, yeah, you know, uh, Maria, we were talking about Alejandro Bachman, who, you know, is, is a programmer at the um, Austrian Film Museum. Uh, hope, hope he's with us or, you know, at least he's greetings to Alejandro, wherever you are. Um, we, we've had, you know, he's a big fan of desktop cinema, but at the same time, um, he is also skeptical, very meaningfully skeptical, because he's like, I, I really don't believe in this, like, interactive culture. Uh, you know, like asking the audience to have to do more to like give feedback or whatever. Um, cinema was always interactive. And I, I like just sitting in a cinema and letting the images come to me and letting the sounds come to me and really kind of being in my own, sitting inside of my own thoughts and my own responses. And I don't have to do more than that. It's, it's, it's more meditative. And, you know, I, I really appreciate that perspective. Um, and, the, and now it, it makes me wonder, uh, how could internet culture, how could the, the space of the internet and digital, um, cinema allow for this type of meditative state, um, this, this meditative state of cinema and not, not this like action blockbuster, you know, I gotta mm -hmm. do this, do that kind of thing. Um, but I think it's also important to, to just kind of see the full spectrum of possibilities and that they can, that each one has a place to exist, and that um, especially young people are exposed to the different possibilities and what they provide for them. Yeah, um, I think also when when I was thinking about how how you kind of how the development went with your with your works, uh, content wise, um, especially um, in that way thinking. Um, that if I got it right, please correct me if I'm wrong, that it was actually first the video essays with which are really much, very much focused on film um, and film history. But then I thought about, okay, but you also do, you go so straightforward into media. You cannot, you, you use YouTube footage for your work. You kind of take already existing audiovisual pieces out of already existing audiovisual work and put it into something completely new. And this was the one aspect, but then you also now um, are talking about personal experience and, and your private experiences. Um, and then I thought about, okay, and you have that online. I realized that you are very generous with having all your materials, videos, you're really sharing everything. I watched an interview where it's just like, yeah, just take your phones out, make screenshots, just, yeah, <laughs> grab all the information that you have. And I find it really impressive because those are what you mentioned before, this... Um, uh, hunger for exclusivity which festivals for example had before it's yeah not there when when I look at your work nevertheless I was asking myself if you ever had doubts about if this is a good decision to have like all this available uh, and accessible all over the world all the time um <laughs> what can I say I mean uh I think I've I started it so I've started in that state so at, at such a um, foundational moment in my life and career where I was just not getting very far with um, you know trying to send my work to to festivals um, and just using the internet as a space to really um, nurture myself to to support myself uh, to feel like okay I have I have an audience here 
and I can work with that. I can cultivate that through my work and I have this feedback loop. You know, it's like instead of instead of sending something to festivals and not getting any reply at all or just some kind of polite but impersonal uh, thanks but no thanks, uh, I have this audience that I can really uh, build my work with. I mean, it really had a formative influence on my development um, with the video essays, you know, and it, in some ways I kind of built my own cinema space, if you want to think of it that way. Like here I am, here's my video essays and here's, and my audience kind of gathers and we talk. Uh, so it was, it was almost like a kind of micro cinema. Um, so, yeah, so I guess I was always kind of used to, I, I always appreciated that kind of utopian aspect of it that it, you know, and I'm, and I'm not saying that it's like perfect. I mean, it's certainly, um, I've also had problems with YouTube. I've had YouTube shut down my account twice uh, because of the issues of like copyright which made me much more sensitive to the, the stakes of how media is controlled and who owns it. And I know that you know, YouTube in some ways owns the videos that I, um, I upload there and they can do what they want with it. But then, you know, these, these questions of ownership, uh, they also apply to, uh, to the film festival and the gallery context as well. You know, it's like for artists to, they have to kind of give up some control uh, to allow a festival to show the work. And so it is a question of these kinds of social bonds um, and these relationships, which again, uh, I, you know, I, said, I said at the end of my talk, cinema is not about the, the was und, und das wie, but the wer and das who, like really um, it's about people, um, the people of cinema and the places of cinema. Like these are the questions that uh, we should be focused on. Like, um, what are the relationships that cinema creates? Um, and yeah, uh, so, so I think I'm not, I'm not so worried about where my work is as long as it is in good hands, you know, um, and, yes. good, and it creates good relationships and good, good uh, situations. And now for um, the, the new project, what you mentioned, Bottled Songs, um, because this is, I, I think so. Like you, you have as as a creator. Let's put it like this to kind of um, take a position, and and you have to make this active choice of which footage you are going to show. And uh, I mean, it, it is kind of like a very sensitive topic. So I, I was wondering, how do you how do you start developing such a project? Is there something like like a script or a text or Thoughts also with the collaboration with Chloe. Um, how did you how did you develop such a project? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a bit of a kind of uh, a little naive to be honest, because I think we were both um, doing media research. Uh, Chloe is a is a media research and filmmaker, and I'm a video essayist. And I think we both were very drawn to the the kind of uh, possibilities and the power of video essay analysis, uh, what, it, what insights it could lend to any material. So as you said, uh, Maria, I started off looking at movies uh, in the early days. I started making video essays in 2006, 15 years ago, just looking at you know, classic films and international films and really helping to bring insights about them. And as you said, like it gradually moved to like media research. And this is actually what Chloe is very interested in, YouTube, um, online uh, media production, and how we understand ourselves and each other through these kinds of personal media productions. And so when it came to the media of ISIS, uh, I was interested in just like how they were using the, um, it was like a combination of the, the kind of established film aesthetics I was looking at in the past and the the new the new like online aesthetics uh, that I look at now how they were using kind of like blockbuster film aesthetics to create propaganda to distribute online um, and so we we did it uh, maybe we kind of underestimated just how difficult it is to like engage with this material um, not so much for the graphic violence I mean we there is no graphic violence in these um, the the bottled songs projects just just so that you everyone is clear. Um, but actually, it's actually more a depiction of psychological um, harm, like just thinking about how what this what this media is doing in the networks, how it exploits networks and how vulnerable 
online media networks are um, really disturbed us. It was more it was more that kind of um, you know uh, realization that disturbed us than anything that was visual. Um, so yeah, and and now we are kind of in this point of thinking about um, how other people have found ways of dealing with this media as well as the um, this kind of vulnerable um, media environment that we are in now, where um, you know extremist content and propaganda can circulate very easily. Uh, so we are looking at artists, we're looking at um, regulators, uh, people in law, uh, as well as like people who have um, kind of unexpected personal relationships to uh, extremist media, just as a way of seeing how different people uh, relate to this contemporary um, yeah, media environment. And how do you how do you look for the for the footage like i mean I'm, I'm what i mentioned before also that you take these pieces out of maybe yeah other context uh, also a legal question maybe is what you're doing how, how does this work uh, with your project so when you take stuff which is online but you put it in a different context well i think this is a perpetual great question i mean i've been dealing with this ever since the beginning with with video essays what i've learned is that it's never a static there is no like static um, law or regulation, like the laws that were in place uh, or not in place uh, 15 years ago are different from what's going on now. And so for me, it's important, um, not so much a question of whether I'm following laws or rules, but uh, if my work is somehow making the logic of regulation more visible, you know what I mean? It's it's kind of similar to what I was saying about Zoom. Like I'm not using Zoom just to like do this talk with you, Maria. I want us to see Zoom in front of us and to really ask ourselves, okay, what is this thing? What what is it doing? And what can we do with it? So in other words, I I I want like the apparatus that we have taken for granted historically to now be the for in the foreground. It's like what I did with the um, the explosive paradox, kind of like using this former cinema that is now a liquor store and really like <laughs> re reflecting on it as a site you know I didn't and I didn't you know I just went to the movie theater and watched movies but now I can reflect on the theater itself as a historical uh, phenomenon uh, and really what it can tell me in the present about where I am and my experience of space and time and people. I, I'm sorry I don't know if this was the first work where you kind of left really physically the, the desktop uh, and uh, yeah, decided to go stylistically a different way? Uh, we, I've done it in the past, but maybe not to, the, to this extent. I mean, uh, if you know my work, Transformers, the pre-make, that was actually originally an attempt to do a, a documentary in space. Like I was filming um, the production of Transformers in Chicago. Uh, but what, and, and that was because I wanted to get as far away from computers as possible because I was a freelance film critic at the time. And I was so burned out from just being on my computer and social media that I really just wanted to be in space. But then what happened was I, I had a very limited view of the production because I was not official. I was not, a you know, a, a official authorized uh, reporter. Um, but then seeing everybody else around me filming and then putting their videos online took me back to the internet to see what all their all their footage was and so then I ended up making a desktop documentary for the first time so <laughs> I've, I've always had this kind of uh, circular relationship between online and offline you know and I don't think you can I don't know I, th I don't think you can separate these two I think now we really have to ask ourselves what is the what is our how do we define our hybridity I think hybridity is really just our, our way of living now. And it's just what we have to understand more deeply. And uh, maybe as a, as a last question, or I don't know, maybe it's just a comment. If you have like a, a, a recommendation, what you would like to, to say to filmmakers who are thinking about maybe trying something uh, like a desktop document, documentary working online, is there um, something that you can give them on their way as a, uh, yeah. So much more experienced filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the internet is your movie set. 
and uh, you know it's like uh, any anything is possible and i would just say like uh, again don't take your tools your platforms and your places for granted like uh, question what is what is the foreground and what is the background question what is behind the scenes and what is the the image if you are able to yeah mix this up and and allow us to see a different perspective i think you're doing something original and useful for us thank you kevin i think this is uh, some great uh, closing for for our talk thank you for your time and the insight and your work i think it is really amazing um, and um, yeah, for, for everybody who joined us, uh, before we now close the session, I want um, also to uh, let you know that we have a second industry program in the afternoon, uh, which is also um, part of our Fusing the Worlds um, part. It is called Those Who Care About Curating Today with Ilaria Conti, who is the curator and founder of Altering Shift Commuting. Anna Henkel Donnersmark, curator of and head of Berlinale Shorts, and Renaud Proch, who is the executive and artistic director of Independent Curators International. So we will dive deeper into this fusing the world uh, topic and uh, see uh, how they think about it and uh, learn more about their perspectives. And yeah, again, I want to thank all our funders, supporters, uh, collaboration partners, and the tech team for making this talk uh, possible today. Thank you. Yeah.